my goodness! Holy sh! folks on behalf of me and not Steve here we'd both like to welcome you back to another episode of Misfit Toys isn't that right buddy it is a lovely spring day here in southern Iowa my first day out wearing my uh, three dollar thrift store shorts and you're lucky enough to get to see my pasty white legs and if it gets warm enough I might even lose the shirt Anyway, it's time for another revival. We've got this 1987 Ford F-250 here. Let's take a closer look at it, shall we? I bought this truck last summer for the princely sum of uh, $300, if I remember right. The uh, story of it was the people that owned it were moving, and if I didn't buy it, it was going to go to the crusher. The only thing I truly know about this truck is when I went and looked at it last summer, the engine was not stuck. And there are no brakes, not surprisingly. Alrighty, here we go. Big block 460. As you can see, the raccoons have decided to use it as a turlet. Lots of poop. And apparently there's some sort of a large leak here. I'm gonna guess it's coming from the power steering somewhere. Now it's actually a fairly solid truck for being here in the Rust Belt. Cab corners are still there. Floors are still intact. It is an automatic. I'm assuming it's a C6. I don't know what else it would be because it's not an overdrive. Seats in not terrible shape. Pretty basic truck. I sure wish it was a four-speed though. I guess there is some patching going on here. I don't know how long it's been off the road. Oh, that's lovely. Maybe we can find a registration buried in here somewhere. I should probably get a pair of gloves for this, but... Oh, that stinks! Yeah, if there's a registration in there, the mice done ate it up a long time ago. Oh, that's nasty. If you've been unlucky enough to put yourself through the misfortune of watching my channel, you know that when I revive a vehicle, I have a purpose in mind for it. Um, this past winter, we revived a square body, drove to a swap meet in Cape Girardeau, Missouri. While I was there, I looked at an Edsel for parts, and I bought it. So, this truck here, the plan is get it running, take it back down to Cape Girardeau, pick up that Edsel, and then hightail it for Springfield, Missouri for a swap meet the next day. So there's my goal. Another goal, today I expected to get up this afternoon for it to be storming severely. That's what the forecast was, and I guess they pushed it back a few hours. So let's see if we can get this thing running before the storm arrives in a couple hours. Now even though there is an abundance of raccoon turds under here, even those don't even compare to that big old turd. In case I haven't mentioned it before, I don't get along with Hollies, and they don't get along with me. Well, it's not stuck, but there are a bunch of mud dauber nests in the linkage. I'll give it a shot, I guess. I just spent a couple minutes kind of looking over things here. I don't know what's going on with this. Right here, every one of these exhaust manifolds has one of these little pipe fittings on it that are smashed shut. I'm guessing some sort of emissions air injection. This has been blocked off. So the PCV system is uh, inoperable. Looks to be, yeah, I don't know where that goes. It's all buried in poop. I'm assuming it's going to the front of the carb there. So it's, it's trying to pull airflow through the block, but it can't do it with that blocked off. Um, Got a broken wire here, which is, if I'm not mistaken, that's green and red. That should be the uh, 
wire that activates the charging system. That needs to go through a keyed source. Uh, it does have oil, it's a little low and dirty, and I can't see any coolant down in here. Well, I can't get the cap off either. But I can hear it gurgling when I squeeze this. Now, thankfully, being as how this is 80s, it is not points. Another thing I don't get along with is points. Good old dependable electronic ignition. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and pull the spark plugs out, take a look at them, give each cylinder a little spritz of oil. Well, I'm not off to a very good start. I've broken off two of the spark plugs. And I was baffled how I've managed to do that, but uh, there we go. Right there. Champion, there's the problem. Doesn't matter that they're broke, they probably wouldn't have ran anyway. As you can probably ascertain by what I'm saying, I think Champion spark plugs are absolute junk. Been my experience, I like uh, auto lights first and uh, ACs second. Champions, I will not use them at all. So it looks like I'm already looking at a trip into town to go get some spark plugs for this. I'm gonna go ahead and spray some, uh, some sort of oil down the cylinders and it can be soaking in while I go do that. See if I can get some PB blaster in there. All right, I'm back from town, got me some new auto light spark plugs, but uh, before I put those in, I'm going to crank the engine over just to make sure it doesn't have a uh, locked up spot in it. Uh, I've got the fuel line unhooked there. I don't know what's in the gas tanks. They actually look pretty decent from the outside. I don't know. Yeah, obviously if there's fuel in there, you don't want it pumping into this carburetor, even though this carburetor honestly is crap anyway. I went ahead and topped off the power steering pump. I've put brake fluid in it just to see if anything will happen there. And I had to come up with some new battery cables because these ones were very sketchy looking. Anyway, she's ready to crank. Let's see what happens. Well, obviously it's not stuck, but it's got one of them damn starters that kicks out. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put the plugs back in, drop some gas down the carb, see if we can't get it to fire. It might be kind of a tough job with the way the starter's kicking out like that. All right, the new plugs are in. They were all gapped perfectly, as auto light plugs always are. You know, the smart thing to do would be to check for spark, but yeah, we're just gonna bypass that and just go for it. <laughs> surprise, surprise, a holly that leaks. Who to thunk it? Folks, that's my biggest beef with hollies. They always leak, for me anyway, and I just won't tolerate that. Well, sounds pretty good. There's no knocking or clattering. I'm kind of not sure what was coming out of the tailpipe because there is no tailpipe. It just dumps underneath the truck. But so far, it's looking pretty good. That transmission fluid does not look good at all. Looks like dirty motor oil. It's not red at all. To be honest, I actually have a ZF5. I wanted to swap into this. I might have to at this point. But uh, yeah, I don't. Even if this transmission works, I don't feel good about using it with the fluid looking like that.
Well, there you have it. It does move. All right, I got started removing a bunch of crap. Man, just look at all those. That's not raccoon shit so much as it is mouse turds and whatnot. I decided to take the radiator out because as you can see, it's full of crap. So I want to pressure wash that out. Obviously, I took the holly out because I have no interest in running that. Uh, that's a 2G alternator. These are uh, well known for the connections in here getting corroded and then they'll catch on fire. So I'm going to convert over to a 3G and put it over on the other side of the edge compartment like it's supposed to be. This bottom radiator hose was pretty soft and rotten right there, so I'm going to change that out. Uh, yeah, look at all these vacuum lines and crap that came off of that carburetor. Well, folks, it is the next day. And as you can tell, there's been a drastic change in the weather by the way I'm dressed. I guess I didn't say it yesterday, but I am going to continue on with the truck. The engine sounds good. No rattles or anything. No smoking. I just assumed you'd figure that out by me pulling the parts off to work on it some more. But anyway, I was getting ready to order parts and I thought I would order some brake components. And before I had to do that, I had to figure out what size brake shoes I needed in the rear. Well, once I got in there, the shoes actually look pretty good. There's plenty of, plenty of lining there. They don't look really overly old and brittle. I still might order some, go ahead and price them first. But what I did notice, the last person that did a brake job on this put both of the short side shoes on the driver's side and both of the long side shoes on the passenger side. So I will be taking them apart regardless anyway to fix that issue. Plus some of the hardware, like this uh, spring here on the adjuster is broken and the cable here that runs down to the adjuster is missing. Uh, so I'll probably be ordering some of that. All right, it's a couple of days later now. Maybe spring is here for good this time. Got some of my parts for the truck have come in. The rest should be in within a couple of days, so it's a nice day out here. I think I shall resume the cleanup of the truck. stuff off I gotta get in here and chisel all this out this is something I want to show you now before I forget it and it is brilliant I love it this door handle these are known for breaking off and that I never even thought of doing something like that just putting a bolt in I love it that is like apocalyptic rat rod all right, back from pressure washing. I didn't want to record it because I didn't even want to do it, let alone record it. Who'd want to watch that anyway? Uh, didn't have any degreaser to put on it, so that's okay. Mostly I just want to get all the dirt from out of the intake and all the poop from the fender oil. There's a little bit left down that corner, but it's uh, much better than it was. I even uh, pressure washed the inside of the cab out. It was... Uh, Quite the sight seeing all that uh, mouse poop soup rolling out of here. I actually don't smell too bad in here now. Anyway, I'm gonna let her dry off for you. Well, I guess it's got a few days to dry off till the rest of my parts get here. Yet another day has passed. My parts didn't come in, but it was too nice a day out to not work on this. So here's what I did. Decided to go ahead and pull the transmission pan, get a closer look at what's going on in there. I'm actually not feeling too bad about it now. It doesn't smell burnt, and there's no chunky chunks in there, just yeah, powder remnants from the uh, clutch bands. The filter, no chunks in that. Nice thing about these filters, you don't have to replace them, it's just a metal screen. You clean it out and put it back on. I think this is some sort of a magnet somebody put in there, but yeah, it's just, there's no chunks on it, just, just a, a general slime. And I also went ahead and pulled the differential cover off the rear. Get at it. Everything looks pretty good in there, no chunks. Filter and pan, all nice and clean. Well, folks, it looks like I lucked out. It did not storm today. It won't be coming in for a few hours, so I'll be able to get a little bit of work done on this today. 
Now C6s are damn good transmissions, although they're not infallible. The main reasons I'd rather go with a ZF5 is I just like driving a manual transmission. And a manual transmission is going to get better mileage than an automatic. Especially not an older style automatic like this that does not have a lockup converter. And a ZF5 has an overdrive gear too. But uh, I'll just have to do that later on once I've gathered up all the parts and I have the time to do it. Hey kitty, what's up? Alright, the transmission pan is nice and clean. It'll radiate some heat away, but uh, yeah, the rest of the transmission is rather nasty looking. Anyway, uh, one of the nice things about C6s, they've got this really neat drain plug in the converter. So yeah, you can drain all the fluid virtually. So I'll get that slammed back into the converter and throw some fluid in it. I think while I'm underneath here, I'm going to go ahead and drain the transfer case too because I'm definitely going to want to change that fluid. We'll see how that looks. That looks pretty good. No glitter in it. Excellent. Well, it seems like a good idea to be working on stuff up front here now that the radiator and the shroud are out of the way. It seems like a perfect opportunity and I'm going to start with that fuel pump. It's always a good idea to replace these old mechanical fuel pumps on a vehicle that's been sitting for a while because you don't know how well that uh, rubber diaphragm inside there, how dried out it's, it is. So I've got a genuine, I don't know how good a quality Carter stuff is anymore, but that's what I'm putting in it. That line's on the fuel pump, kind of hard to get to. I'm glad the radiator was out. I went in and pulled the uh, grill out to access it and the AC condenser, which as you can tell, is not hooked up anyway. Well, there's a problem with the fuel pump here. These are the original bolts, which cleared that housing just fine, but they will not clear that housing. Because the housing is different, it is actually thicker on this one and thinner, so yeah, just a shorter bolt solves the problem. Alright folks, I don't know what day it is, I'll put it in here somewhere, but uh, yeah, time has dwindled away from me even more. I probably wouldn't even be working on this today, but I'm already welding on a friend's trailer, so I'm going to weld on this intake manifold. Yes, you heard me right. What I'm going to do is attempt to plug up this exhaust passage with weld. Now obviously those of you out there that are familiar with welding, uh, cast iron does not weld with a dam. The right way to do this would be with some nickel rods, but those are expensive. And uh, this is not a structural weld, and that's not a lot of pressure coming through that. Basically, I'm just going to clean the carbon out of that, get in there, and just booger weld a plug in there in place just to keep the hot exhaust gases from coming through to where the uh, EGR used to be but will not be anymore. And I'm wobbling all over with this camera. Anyway, let's get busy. get you in here and wait a minute where is it looks reasonably clean now let's get the welding disaster going That'll be good enough just to stop exhaust gases from coming through there. Well folks, it's getting down to being just a couple of weeks. I don't know how many days I got left. I'll put it in here somewhere. Maybe right about here. But uh, anyway, this afternoon I got something else done. Things are starting to get where I can spend a little day, a little day, a little time on the truck. It's a nice afternoon. You know, past four days the wind's just been howling here so I just stayed inside the shop but anyway here's my thoughts for the truck today 
I was thinking about trying to get all the front accessories back on, but instead of that, I'm going to do something foolish. These headers that have been hanging on my wall for years. I don't even know if these will fit this truck. I believe they will though. And they're tri-wise, as you can see, which are supposed to be legendary for making low-end torque. But uh, I think I will start with the driver's side because that's going to have the most clearance issues with drive shaft and whatnot and shifter linkages and stuff. It's, uh, just thought it'd be better to do this, you know, without having all the accessories here in the way. It might be easier to just get them snaked in there. But, uh, let's get busy and get something done today. Until I crawled underneath here to get that exhaust off, I had pretty much forgotten that I'd drained the transfer case. So let's get that taken care of while I'm thinking of it. headers are apparently for a four speed so there it is I mean that could be re-engineered too but it's debatable whether I would have enough time just to mess around with brake lines and everything else so there it is we're right back to uh, the original decision the exhaust manifolds and the exhaust are going back on it well now that I've learned that those uh, headers won't fit and uh, in instances like this isn't learning fun I've got the manifold back on it. I'm out here working on an exhaust right now. Let me show you what I got going on here. This was the exhaust that was hanging on it. This was it, right to here. Oddly enough, it was not that loud with it just dumping like that. Uh, these were in the back of the truck in the bed. Obviously, at one point they were bolted on, but looks like the bolts broke or rotted away. I'm going to cut this rotten flange off here and either cut these uh, glass packs off and stick them on there or I might try to get this Magnaflow dual in dual outlet on there. We shall see what fits. All right, major setback here. These threads are ganked. Maybe I will have learned something from messing with something that didn't need to be messed with. So, let's see here. Also, I've already got this one out. I decided to just go ahead and pull both of them and change the studs out. I got to run to town and get studs. But in the process of while I had this one out, I went ahead and cut all these damned annoying things off. They weren't really causing a big problem. They were just annoying and even less or so I hated the way they looked. So, these studs came out pretty easy with some heat. These ones are going to be a little tougher because I don't know what I'm going to have to grab onto that. So the whole reason for drilling the hole was just to clean out the metal in there. And this insert here is not cast. It's some sort of steel. I'm just guessing it's just regular mild steel, so it welds pretty nice. And I took the opportunity to clean this up. I'm going to weld that nut onto it to help get it back out of there. Nice and purdy. 
We'll see if that'll get that off. There's that. There we go. Come on, focus. Looks like the threads are fairly much intact. Well, as you saw, that one came out. When I went to do the other one, where'd it go? It snapped off. So it took me four attempts before I finally got the broken stud out, welding a uh, three-quarter inch nut to it. I was beginning to wonder there if I was gonna have to drill it out, but uh, thankfully not. I'm gonna go put on a, a more less odd hat, wash my face, go to town, get some studs now. Some exhaust manifolds ought to be good and cooled off by the time I get back. Now at this point, with no more time than I have left, I've already resigned myself to the idea that this truck is not going to be done on time. But that's not so bad. I'll still use it to tow something. So yeah, the the uh, the goal is the same. It's just the uh, target has uh, shifted, I guess you could say. But anyway, got the new studs into the manifolds. I'm going to go out there and uh, get them slammed back onto the block. All right, manifolds are back on. No busted knuckles. Uh, I guess if I have to try to look for a bright side to this whole uh, attempted header debacle, it was that uh, it gave me the opportunity to get rid of those uh, twisted, mangled up air injection lines that were on there. A lot cleaner look, and yeah, those were in the way. Not to where they were a real big problem, they were just kind of a real nuisance. I guess if you did get careless in there, they could have gouged you pretty good, but uh... Anyway, at this point, after all the trouble this exhaust has given me, I've come to the conclusion that this exhaust does not deserve this pretty stainless steel MagnaFlow muffler. As punishment, it's going to get the rusty old glass packs. That'll teach you. Finally, the exhaust is back in place. Hope you like my exhaust hanger there. Yeah, folks, you know, don't chintz out with the cheap wire. Use the good thick stuff. And you know, I know this looks hack, and it only looks hack because it really is. But anyway, let's move on to something else now, finally. All right, folks, the struggle continues. I finally got this 3G alternator to fit. I've never had to put one in a, one of these before. Here's the problem right there. That, uh, yeah, the case on the alternator gets into this whole mounting bracket. I took quite a bit out of that bracket, and I know it looks really thin right there, and it is really thin right there, but uh, back there towards the engine block, it is a lot thicker than that. It doesn't get quite that thin, and frankly, I'm not that concerned about it anyway because at this point the bracket is really only a spacer. This bolt going through the whole thing anchors right into the block. And I didn't have to do anything to this point out here. So yeah, there's going to be more stress out here than right here. Basically that is just a spacer. Um, now that the 3G alternator is in place, I have to do the pulley thing. I'll show you how to do that and that is a real quick modification there. Hear that? It just barely rubs on these ribs right there. Get you a little flap wheel action going here. Quite enough, apparently. I'll be back. Hmm. 
I guess it's these double sheave ones. I'm gonna go see if I got a single one. Yeah, I think I might have one. Much better. Typically, you don't even need the flap wheel to do that. There's such a little mount that needs to come off, you could do it with a file if you had to. Zing! I did decide before I got all the accessories on it, I was going to change out the steering box and the pump. I'm 80, maybe 90% sure that the steering box is where the power steering leak is coming from. Um, I could pull it off and reseal it. Nah. I got a parts truck here. I'm going to pull the steering box and the pump off of this. Slap it on the red truck there. I guess, yeah, as you can tell, I'm not real excited about this whole project anymore. And I think, yeah, well, no think about it, I know it. A big part of my lack of enthusiasm is I just friggin hate this body style. I like the earlier one, but I, I don't know why, I just hate this flat brick nose style. This, to me, this is like, um, I don't know, this is going to get some hate from the Chevy guys, but I don't get the whole square body, the love of square bodies. They are just a brick with no styling whatsoever, just like this. But that's what it is. I guess people that love them, that's great on you. I just don't see it. So it appears to me that this rag joint is pretty soft and rotten from years of being soaked in a power steering fluid. I'll take a look at the parts truck one, see if it's any better. The rag joint is in a much better shape, but it does look like I'm going to have to change the pitman arm out. Not a big deal. Now that's obviously not a good idea to be doing it this way, but yeah, my puller, I couldn't find my smaller one, so. All right, it's finally all back in there. Maybe I can start moving forward again. Uh, I did spend a little time getting my wiring cleaned up, got rid of all the old alternator wiring here. I think I've covered this before and it's pretty easy. There's lots of this information out there about wiring up a 3G. Basically, there's there's two wires that come off of a plug here. Uh, yellow one, you just loop it right back around and put it on the hot post. And then you've got this green with a red tracer. That is what actually energizes the fields that gets the alternator charging. Now one problem I found with this truck, um, the green with red tracer wire that was right here, uh, it had a really weak signal. And there were three other wires that were coming into the same plug as it, and the other three wires were not being used. I found this red one. It was it had the same function as the uh, green with red tracer. It's hot when the key is on. It's and off when the key is off. So I decided to just go ahead and use that, seeing as how the signal for that one was so weak. And uh, the big charging wire coming off the back of the alternator, you just run right, it right up here to your battery or a hot post, you know, whatever, as long as it gets back to the battery. Now, if this were a vehicle that were using um, a winch, electric fan, lights and all that, you'd want a bigger gauge wire than this, but this vehicle is pretty simple. It's a carburetor, uh, but the only electrics are going to be the turn signals and the headlights, so this gauge wire will be just fine for that. Well, I missed my target, obviously. That was like, I don't know, six weeks, two months ago. Trip went fine. I used the van. It did flawlessly. Edsel is home, tucked away in the shed, nice and snug. But I should continue pecking away at this truck. Now, uh, when I first opened these drums up to take a look at the brakes, I did notice how crusty these U-bolt plates were. And I kind of cringed, but like, okay, I think they'll be okay. Yeah, they are not. Um, before I went on the trip, I was underneath here putting the cover back on the differential. I don't know if I can get a good shot of it here. 
Let's see if I can zoom in. But yeah, looking at it from underneath, wow, those plates are just totally rotted away. This one in particular I'm showing you. The other one isn't quite so bad. Where is it? Where is it? Down lower. There we go. But I'm going to replace them today anyway. Got some U-bolts and plates here that I had squirreled away out in the part shed. Yes, I'm going to reuse U-bolts. I know everybody tells you, you got to use new U-bolts. Oh, that's a crock of shit. I've been doing this all my life, reusing U-bolts with no problem. That's just something made up by the evil and greedy U-bolt industry to get you to buy more U-bolts. Pretty obvious, I can't reuse this one, these ones, because the threads are just totally rusted away on them. Oh my god! Woo! That was a hell of a bang! <laughs> Well, I think this will show you the true uh, nastiness of this U-bolt plate. I'm really puzzled. I mean, the body of that truck, it's got rust on it too, no doubt about it. But it seems like the, the chassis and the frame are way worse than the body. I don't know, maybe that body's been swapped out at some point. Yeah, that thing, that was a disaster just waiting to happen. Could have seen hauling down the road with a big old load on it under heavy throttle going up a hill and then that uh, rear end could have got spit out. This one not quite as bad but still pretty damn bad. Now this kind of concerned me too. Uh, as you can see, that rust has been sitting around that plate eating for so long that it's eaten into the leaf spring too. See how thick it is right here? And then it gets pretty damn thin in there. Actually, I'm kind of relieved that they didn't break. I've run into this before taking the U-bolts out of a rusty spring pack. And as soon as you release the tension, the spring breaks. But uh, we're just gonna run it. All right, so it looks like I might have to buy one new U-bolt. Um, this U-bolt here, I was missing two nuts. So I just went to the hardware store and got these. They look like the same thread pitch, but apparently they are not. This is about as far as I can get them to go. And it's just turning into a back-breaking affair trying to turn those, especially this one. So I'm probably, yeah, I can't even back them off hardly. Um, I'm probably just gonna go ahead and cut that off and then go to, go to the hardware store. Get a new U-bolt for that side. The, these ones, uh, I figured the threads would kind of loosen up. They were rusty, but yeah, these ones did. The other side did just fine, but yeah, these two with the uh, regular hardware store nuts just weren't going to cut it. So in the meantime, I thought about going to the store today and getting one, but uh, I didn't really didn't feel like going to town because you know how it is. Towns where everybody hates you. Kids all try to beat you up. Instead, I turned my attention to putting all new brakes on. Got new wheel cylinders, new shoes, all new springs and hardware in there. She's all ready to go. Got her adjusted out and ready to slap the drum on. And I also put, uh, refilled the differential with some fresh gear oil. Uh, only thing left to do back here is I'll put a rubber line in that I've already ordered. Now I'm gonna run new brake lines because when I was cutting the U-bolts on that side, I got into the brake line and somebody had replaced the one on this side and they had a big old loop in it anyway so i'll just do all all new ones back here but anyway that's it for today maybe i'll get back to this in another two months I'm supposed to be working on the fu50 today but uh, here i am camped out in the yard and here's why moving some stuff around today and there was some i I think there might be more than one, but there was at least one groundhog down there, and I know there was at least one because I got one already. So I'm just going to sit here for a while longer and uh, wait, see if I can get some more. That one didn't take very long. 
Well, I've been sitting out here about an hour and a half. I think I'm about ready to give it up. Um, I'm pretty damn sure there's more than one out there. I saw, before I went and got the rifle, I saw two. I don't know that, I can't guarantee they were different, but the first one I saw sure seemed a lot bigger than this one I ended up shooting. But uh, I'm getting impatient, I got things to do. All right, folks, it's been a couple more weeks. Yeah, this is uh, pretty disgusting even for me that I'm not getting anywhere. I don't seem to be getting anything done this summer. That's why I have the lack of videos I'm putting out. But anyway, let's show you what I'm up to today. All right, got the uh, brake lines in place. Steel, new rubber line, got a brand new U-bolt on there. Everything back here is just dandy. Now, if you're like me, you hate doing brake work. So I'm just going to go ahead and say brake work should be done in moderation. Let's move back up to the front of the truck and do something about getting this thing running again. Now, I believe I mentioned it earlier, I was going to try to take the uh, AC condenser that was up here and try using it as a transmission cooler. I've done that before in the past. It works pretty good. Uh, I didn't have any film of it, but it didn't work out with that one. I could not get the fittings off of it to adapt it to the transmission lines and it ended up messing it up. But I did find another one. I have no idea what it's off of. It was out there in my part shed, but it should just fit. I'm gonna have to take this bumper off to get in there, but I should be able to bolt it in right in here damn near perfectly. And I've got all the fittings to adapt it to the transmission lines. it is in yeah like I said I've done this three or four times before and I've kind of always been concerned that there would be so much resistance in this that it wouldn't flow well but that's never been the case so yeah that's why I keep doing it it's a nice big huge cooler I mean going out and buying a brand new oil cooler is uh, that's for little bitches when you got stuff like this sitting around so you can see here I've uh, adapted these hoses and whatnot with various fittings clamps and lines um, my bigger concern than actual flow through this, liquid flow, not airflow, is uh, this half inch line. I don't know if that's rated for oil, but it was what I had. I'll keep an eye on it, or maybe I'll just go get some at the parts store next time I'm there. A uh, good thing about it, it's easy to change because it's right out in front, right out in the open. Only thing I'll have to do is get the grill out of the way. Went ahead and got the radiator in. And the shroud and the hoses, I'm starting to fill it up. Uh, once again, that's all the time I have this afternoon. One kitty! Ah, 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 how you doing? Two kitty! Ah, ah, ah. Three kitties! Ah, ah, hey, come here so I can pet you. All right, been another week. Today I'm up here trying to get uh, the uh, stuff going, some spark and some fuel. Don't know how well that's going because it's not started out very well. I was gonna recurve the distributor. <clears throat> now, if you don't know what all that entails, you could go back to my 76 Bronco series when I put together the 302 engine to put in that. Now, I could like put a link up here or something, but uh, I'm not that smart. So if you want to find that, you're just going to have to go look for it in my 76 Bronco series. But uh, what it will entail, I will be pulling the, uh, God, I don't know what they're called. I'm going to call it an armature that's down below this plate that controls how much advance that is put in. Uh, typically, I'll take this armature out, and if there's not a, an option for 20 degrees, I will weld it up and grind it back down to make 20 degrees. And then I'll put a lighter spring kit in here as well, so the advance comes in faster. What I'm finding so far is pretty interesting here. Not surprisingly, the distributor body is stuck, and I wasn't planning on pulling it completely out. But obviously, I'll need it freed up 
when the time comes and I get it running again to uh, set the timing. Even more interesting here, the plate that the magnetic pickup on is sits on, it is stuck. So I gotta deal with that. Now I do have this soaking with some croil and I've been tapping on it and I think I've got it moving. I am pretty sure I started moving a little bit. I'm gonna let it soak in some more and just keep tapping on it. Or maybe it's just a case of wishful thinking and uh, seeing what you want to see. But anyway, I'm going to get back to work on getting this thing apart. All right, I did get this one apart. I removed the little clip, put some croil on there, took a screwdriver and just tapped on it here. Tapped on it there, just kept working it back and forth several times till I got it loose enough I could get my hand in there and just spin it like so. And that is what was seized up. It actually came apart pretty easy. Now, I'm still dealing with the distributor body. What I've been doing with this, and it is moving, see this big aluminum tab down here? I've been tapping on it with a hammer this way. And then I'll either tap on it here or here to go the other way. And it is working back and forth. I don't think I can turn it by hand yet. Nope, but uh, I'm slowly getting more and more movement out of it. I was going to try to put this uh, chain vice grip around it, but there's just not enough clearance right there. So I'm just going to have to keep working it back and forth. I think now that I got it uh, going back and forth, I am going to try to gently just get the whole thing pulled out of there just so I can clean it up and get it where it moves easier. Now you don't want to get too crazy with this because this is only aluminum and if I keep at this it wouldn't surprise me if I end up breaking this housing. I'm going to see if I can't start getting it worked up out of there. Patience is the key. If this didn't work I'd probably apply a little bit of heat to it down in here. It looks to me like it is coming out. There we go. Not too bad. All right, I pulled the O-ring off of it, took it inside, and hit it with a wire brush for a little bit, and it is nice and free now, as you can see. So let's move on with the recurving, which will take place in here. All right, so here's what I came up with. This, I welded it shut, well not completely shut, and I made this into a 10, and this side, into a 13 based on some measurements of a 10 and a 13 I got here. That's a 10 with a 15 on it. Now it's kind of weird because, uh, yeah, don't ask me why Ford did this. The 10, that actually means 20 degrees of mechanical advance. You double that number. Why they didn't just print it as 20, I don't know. Who knows why auto manufacturers do the weird things they do. I'm probably, because this truck is gonna be towing heavy loads, I'm gonna do the 10. And instead of putting the two really light springs from out of this kit in it, I'm going to use one of the light springs and one of the original springs and see how well that does. And the nice thing about this is uh, if I feel like uh, this is too conservative, once I drive it for a little bit, I can tear into the distributor. Now that it's been taken apart, it'll be easier to get apart again. And I can flip it over and give it some more mechanical advance or even go in there and uh, piddle around with the springs some more. All right, it's been a few more days. She's a hot one out today. Got the distributor in. Got this excellent Edelbrock AVS2 650 carburetor on here. It is hooked up just right now for gravity feed. And <clears throat> look at that, no leaks. That's just what I spilled when I was hooking it up. I've got a uh, one inch phenolic spacer underneath the carb, kind of to take up the room where the EGR plate was. I could have made the EGR plate work with some modifications, but uh, 
yeah why when this will uh, give me like kind of a heat barrier to hopefully keep not quite as much heat soak coming through to the carburetor but uh, the old fuel line here that's coming from the tank I've got it routed to just spit out there on the ground for whatever nastiness uh, once I get it running and get all the fluids topped off I know the transmission is going to need some fluid probably the power steering you know once I'm happy with the way it's running I will go ahead and pour some fuel in the tanks and see what comes spitting out of there. See how nasty it is. The tanks look pretty good from the outside. They don't look rusted out. So we shall see. Let's get to start and see what happens with this. can already tell I've got the timing too far advanced. Hearing a little bit of a knock in there. I don't know if it's a knocking noise or it's kind of more like a growling now. It could be just the power steering pump growling because it needs fluid. I guess possibly even the transmission. smell the mouse piss residue burning off of that engine. Wow, it smells nasty.
All right, folks, I've got three problems here of varying uh, intensities. Let's uh, get you turned around here. Now, uh, number one, this fan, it is moving air, but it's kind of weird. Normally, yeah, you can put your hand right back here behind the blade and feel airflow. I'm not feeling that. It's moving air out of here. And you can still feel it, you know, pulling some air through here. I don't know if that'll be an issue or what. Might have to look for a bigger fan or make that fan shroud smaller. Uh, the temperature gauge does seem to be working. It does it says it's not running hot, but it sure feels hot. But it is a hot day out here. Number two, as much as I like Edelbrock carbs, this one is, if you watched my Edsel video, ow, that's hot. Um, this carb Adjusting these uh, idle mixture screws did nothing. It didn't matter how far in you ran them or out They would do nothing until you took one of these all the way out and that would cause a big enough vacuum leak that it would kill the engine And it's doing the same thing on this not surprisingly uh, So in order to get the idle adjusted properly, I have to use the actual Mechanical idle and then that uh, exposes more of the transfer slots that I'd like and it's putting vacuum through to the timed advance port um I don't know what's wrong with this carb why it's doing that, but I might just have to, uh, like I got it here, plug off the timed van advance and just run manifold vacuum and get the truck adjusted that way. Because otherwise the carb seems to work pretty good other than that little issue so far. Uh, my biggest issue is that noise. I just don't know what it is. It did seem to quiet down. Excuse me, it is just sweltering. I'm drowning in sweat here. It uh, it did seem to quiet down as the engine warmed up, but it was still there. And it's not really a dull clunk, like a rod or something down in there. I'm not saying it isn't. And you know, where did it come from? It wasn't doing that before when I had this thing running earlier in the spring. But uh, it almost sounds to me like a, the uh, torque converter is loose on the flex plate. And I'm gonna let it cool off a little bit before I get underneath there and check that. But uh, I did, you can kind of hear it reverberating through the exhaust, so maybe it's just something to do with the exhaust. I don't know. Um, but when I did look underneath there, there is a pretty good transmission fluid leak coming right out of the bell housing, it's dripping right on the exhaust. That's my biggest concern at this point because that is just a, a huge fire hazard. Uh, if I have to end up taking this C6 out to uh, fix that seal, I'll just put a manual transmission in it at that point. I'm just not sure I want to put that much effort into this truck anymore. I just don't care about it. Um, or I might just set this truck aside and save it for a future project that I've been thinking of, that I've been wanting to do for years, which honestly I probably never will do, but it would be cool as shit if I did do it. Uh, I'm going to think on that a while. Well, while the truck's cooling down, I'm just going to go ahead and bleed this new master cylinder. I mentioned this before in my other videos, and I'm going to say it again because it's that important of an issue to me. Do not bleed this the way they recommend in the instructions with the little plugs in there. Make these tubes that run around and feed right back into your reservoir. It just makes it so much more efficient. Master cylinders bled, decided I'd go ahead and bolt it on. These are the only good uses for the plugs that come with it, to keep from leaking while you're installing it. Um, I had the front line off while I was messing around with that header idea. Haven't put it back on yet, but that's okay because I haven't done the front brakes yet anyway. The rear brakes are done, so I hooked it up. Got the uh, passenger rear <coughs> cylinder cracked open. We're going to see if it will gravity bleed on its own while I do some other things. All right, I got underneath there, pulled the inspection plate off the torque converter bolts, and uh, they seem to be tight. I fired it back up, and it's definitely coming from out of that bell housing. Let's go down there, and maybe uh, I'm sure the camera should be able to pick it up. So 
what's up is he knocked the torque converter bolts. They checked those. I guess it's a possibility. It could be the uh, bolts that hold the flywheel to the crankshaft. And why now? Why wasn't it doing it in the spring when I had it running? Well, the uh, rear brakes don't seem to be gravity bleeding by themselves. I thought, what the hell? It's time to throw some gas in these tanks. See if they're going to work. I cautiously opened up the uh, door for the rear tank, and thankfully I was cautious about it because when you live here in the Midwest, you look out for these kind of things in the summer. I think I will just try to gently close that, and I will get them in the morning when they're dormant. Okay, that wasn't gently. I'll let them calm down, then I'll get back to working on uh, getting those rear brakes bled. All right, folks, once again, we've uh, melded into the next day. Melded, I don't know, is that a word or just some crap I came up with? Um, last night at work, it gave me time to ponder my issues. Mostly the rattling in the uh, bell housing and the issue with the idle mixture screws not doing anything. And I came up with a couple of theories. Uh, number one, the bell housing noise. It makes the most sense that it's something I did that's changed it, which I don't know what it could be. I have a couple of theories that it, maybe it's in the ignition. Maybe I don't have the... Uh, plug wires on there right. Maybe I have one on there wrong or even though it seems to be running pretty good maybe I have the uh, ignition timing off a little bit. I haven't gotten to the point of fine tuning that. And maybe that's causing some sort of misfire that's reverberating through into the transmission bell housing. I don't know. Seems like a stretch but it just makes more sense that it's something I've changed because that noise was not here a couple months ago last time I had it running. Uh, the only other thing I can think it might be is uh, you noticed how hard it was cranking when I first started trying to start at this t time. And uh, yeah, maybe that damaged the flywheel. And if that's the case, then it was uh, pretty much on the verge of being damaged anyway. But uh, I'm going to, I don't have much time today. I had to run to town, do some errands. Uh, I'm going to try to, you know, I'll recheck the firing order on the spark plug wires and try to do a little more fine tuning on the uh, initial timing, see if that makes the noise go away. Um, hey kitty! Kitty's living the life of leisure here. Oh, hairball there. Alright, I checked my firing order and my plug wires and that seems to be okay. Got underneath here, cleaned up the balancer so I can read the marks. I got it marked top dead center. 10, 20, 30. I think I'm going to shoot for about 12. No? You have something to say about this? You don't think 12 will work? Oh yeah, now you're gonna give me the silent treatment. Not even gonna look at me. Oh, that's cold. Well, I tried filming the uh, timing marks, but it just doesn't work out. Um, it was at, uh, right at zero. Uh, I moved it up to 12, and I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but yeah, the rattle is definitely still there. I'm going to have to give that some more thought. I really don't want to go split the engine transmission to check those uh, flex plate bolts, but it might come to that. I put six gallons of fresh fuel in the rear tank. I've got this longer hose hooked up going into a little uh, plastic jar. Let's uh, fire it up and uh, see what kind of nastiness comes out, if anything does. Well, this is what came out. Not great, but I guess it could be worse. It does vaguely smell like gasoline. And keep in mind, that's with uh, six gallons of fresh fuel put in there. So we're just going to uh, try to uh, dilute out the nastiness by adding more fresh fuel. It seems like the kind of lazy way that appeals to me. And to be brutally honest, the few, if I would have just pumped this tank out, I would have ended up putting that fuel in something. This is as good as any. So that's 12 gallons of fresh fuel in there now, plus whatever was in there to begin with. I'm not seeing any leaks. Now the next big question, at the moment anyway, is the fuel gauge going to work? 
Is that too much to ask for? Yeah, yeah, it ain't gonna work. Well, apparently not Steve here values my $5 suspension seat from the swap meet. You've kind of made it your new home out here in the shop, haven't you? Leave me alone. I'm not going now, kitty. You gonna lock up when you're done out here? Kitty! Kitty! All right, it is yet another day. Hot one again out today. I think today's the hottest day we've seen so far. So what better time than to work on a truck out here in the blazing heat and humidity. Anyway, poor me, wah wah. Today, I'm changing the oil in it. I've also had second thoughts about running that nasty fuel in. As you can see, I've got the gravity tank hooked back up and I'm going to pump all this nasty fuel out into these five gallon buckets. Uh, it is true, I will reuse it, but uh, maybe it'd be better just reuse it a couple gallons at a time in like my Ranger and my van and probably this. But uh, pretty much done with the oil change. And I was gonna work on the front brakes, which I have. I was hoping to just change out the rubber lines. These ones are looking, yeah. But I could not get the bleeder off the caliper. It broke off, not surprisingly. And that's fine because these calipers, I was originally gonna try to use these old calipers, but the bleeder valve breaking off is not a big deal. It's probably a blessing because these calipers are known for sticking. So I'm probably better off getting a new set anyway. So the bleeder breaking off just kind of forced me to do that. But I think I'm pretty well done with anything I can do out here today other than pumping out that old nasty fuel. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. It actually doesn't look too bad coming out of there, but I might as well go ahead and flush it out anyway. Kitty's just chilling in here on the cool concrete floor. What are you coming to me for? I got nothing for you. As soon as this second bucket's full, I'm putting the rest right into the Ranger. Then calling it a day. That'll take my... Uh-oh. I don't know what just happened there. The rattling got worse and it died. <laughs> Maybe it was a rod knock after all. Let's see what happens when I try to start it back up. Almost acts like it's out of fuel. Uh, I don't want to pull that line off there with that engine being that hot. That'd be the... Damn it. <laughs> there you go. Not sure the squirters are working. finishes pumping out if it don't die again let me talk about my next theory with that carburetor now it occurred to me obviously I bought it at swap meet so I'm not the first owner so it's not brand new I think the idle circuit works through the main jet so maybe just maybe previous owner went in there and fiddled around with the uh, metering rods and the jets and they have such a 
um, a big metering rod in there in relation to the jets, it's not letting adequate fuel through to uh, get pulled through the uh, emulsion tube and all that crap. Like I said, I got a uh, got the owner's manual here. I'm going to brush up on the uh, operation of it. Well, once again, it's been a few more days, probably closer to a week. Uh, maybe I'll get this truck up and running and useful before I die. Maybe not. I've got all the new brakes put on it, both sides. Uh, it just need to bleed the front at this point. As for the carb here, I took it inside and took the top off and I went in and I went through the idle circuits with a fine tooth comb. Everything is clear and free as near as I can tell. All the patches and passages appear to be free. Um, I did go ahead and rejet it. Um, let's see here if I can remember the uh, the primary jets were the factory numbers. I could not read the secondaries at all, so I don't know what those were. And the metering rods, the number on those was not even a number that was supposedly in this factory or in the kit so he's obviously somebody has been in here and messed with it now when i did look at it looking at the uh, metering rods and the jets looked like there was plenty of clearance in there so my theory about it running lean uh, may not come to fruition but uh i'll get to see this afternoon i'll try to get this put on throw some more fuel in it another 12 gallons of fresh fuel and get these brakes bled Oh, and just in case you're uh, curious, I uh, jetted it up two steps on the Edelbrock chart. And uh, I know what some of you are thinking, this is a 650, that's not enough for a 460. Um, you might be right. I'm running with the 650 based on the fact that the, uh, the factory holly on this was a 650. And this also, this is a stock engine. If the 650 isn't enough, or if I can't get the uh, idle circuit to work out, I've got another 750. In the shop in there i bought it at a swap meet uh, last winter for 20 bucks it was stuck i got it freed up it's all taken apart and cleaned i got a kit for it just uh yeah i gotta find the time to put it together but uh, this might be the time if i can't get this thing to work this is the first time i've really had any troubles with the nettlebrock all right uh, the fuel is definitely cleaner uh, well what i got going on here now it uh with the larger jetting and metering rods um, it is idling where I don't have to use quite so much of this adjustment but the idle mixture screws are still doing nothing here I'm out of ideas anybody got any ideas I guess at this point I think the next thing I'll do is I'll try putting maybe a, a smaller metering rod into here although I don't think that's gonna do any good and otherwise I'm gonna get busy uh, getting that 750 rebuilt and give it a shot on here like I said this first real problem I've ever had with the nettle brock but at least at this point I've got it where I can back this off enough that it's not pulling vacuum here constantly so I might be able to actually yeah, go ahead and run my timed vacuum again. All right, let's forget this nonsense for now and move on to something else. Bleeding the front brakes. I think I've shown this before, but maybe not. Whoop, where do you think you're going? Now, about 95% of the time, this is the way I bleed brakes. You probably know if you've suffered through enough of my videos that typically I work alone, so I have to find ways to do things alone. And this is a great way to do it. You don't even need an assistant here to break open the bleeder. Just run a hose from the cracked open bleeder into here. Just make sure the hose is down below the level. Get in there and pump the pedal slowly and it'll take care of itself. Obviously, any air bubbles that come out through here cannot go back up because they 
go down in the liquid and come to the surface. Now the only times typically I've found that this system doesn't work is like a prime example would be my 69 Mustang when I first put it together and the only place it had fluid was the master cylinder. Everything else was dry because it was new. Uh, typically, yeah, if you have some fluid in the line somewhere, this will work. Well, well, another problem here, and this one is probably of my own doing. I'm pretty sure, well, matter of fact, I know it as a fact, that uh, I got that banjo bolt in cross-threaded. And once the threads were damaged, I couldn't do anything about it, so I tried to just crank it down, and it ain't working. So, yeah, it looks like I'm buying another new caliper. And uh, I know some of you are probably thinking that uh, you should turn these rotors, you know, and uh, I don't know, if you're kind of lowbrow enough that you're watching my channel, that probably means that you're poor enough that you can't afford to have that done either. It'll clean itself up just fine. If I ever get this thing going. All right, yet again, it's a couple weeks later. I found some time this afternoon to come out here and pedal around with this. Now I went ahead and put smaller uh, oh, metering rods in here. I didn't change the jets, so the smaller metering rods mean it would flow more fuel. Um, I also have been doing a little research on this, seeing if anybody else has run into this trouble, you know, specifically the uh, idle mixture screws not having any effect. Um, I did find where, what is that guy's channel? Muscle Car Solutions, I think. He shows a lot of videos on Edelbrock carbs. And I found some other people, too, that are saying, you know, your tune has to be right, obviously. You know, that's kind of a no-brainer. Your ignition and all that has to be right in order for these to respond. So I've spent the afternoon out here. Well, first of all, I did finally get the, the brakes fixed. They seem, I haven't drove it yet, but I got the other caliper. I've been doing that. But, yeah, I've been playing with the timing as well. I tried advancing it and retarding it, and I, I still get pretty much no difference. At one point, I actually did manage to stall the engine out. You know, I was playing with these idle mixture screws, and I, I uh, was slowly turning both of them in, and then finally this side reached its stop, and the engine died. That's the only response I've got from it since. I'm right back to my 12 degrees ignition timing, and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's still the same. I did... Uh, rebuild this old 750 that I got at a swap meet so once I, I need to run into town get a couple of oil filters I got to change the oil in a couple vehicles here let this cool off and then once I get that oil changed on those vehicles I'm gonna try slapping this on just for uh, shits and giggles got the old school 750 for the win doing great uh, yeah the uh, Mechanical idle set here. It's not even touching It's idling that well. I've got these turned out about maybe one and a half two turns And it does seem a little snappier with the 750 on it as well Yeah, damned if I know what's going on with that 650 AVS I may have to put a heavier step up spring in these. I was messing with those earlier too. And yeah, you really gotta, gotta womp it hard to get them to pop up. Well, folks, it's been another month since I've done any filming on the uh, FU-50. Doesn't mean I haven't been working on it. Uh, I think when I last left off, I actually got to drive it for the first time. I've just been putzing around here on the property with it, and I did take it on a couple mile trip over to a friend's house. Seems to be running pretty good. Uh, so I don't think at this point I'm going to be messing with any of the ignition timing or the carburetor settings. I guess I did turn the uh, idle mixture screws down a little bit. Other than that, I haven't messed with the engine at all. Let me show you what all I've been doing to it. 
I did put in some uh, oddball gauges that I had because I really wanted to know what the oil pressure was because yeah I still haven't figured out what that knocking noise is if it's actually come from the the uh, flex plate the transmission the engine or what but uh, cold it has 60 pounds of pressure once it's fully warmed up it's doing maybe at idle maybe six or eight pounds by that gauge I found this tailgate earlier in the summer on Facebook marketplace for $35 now by the measurements that he gave in the pictures, it was perfect for this truck. And it did fit perfect other than the latches. The latches did not work, so I had to do some modifications there. And I'm kind of proud of this one. Yeah, here's what the... I came up with that. I thought that was pretty clever. Now this was open here in the center for some sort of a fifth wheel or gooseneck thing, but I did not like that. Uh, I just came up with this old ganked up piece of angle iron. It's <laughs> got a little bit of bend in it, but I figure, hell, it's good enough for this tailgate. And then yeah, filled in with some uh, more mesh. Now, let's talk about this ugly thing. I didn't have a hitch to put on it. I, I had two other hitches in my uh, metal pile. They would have required some fabrication to make them work on this. I knew this one would fit because I took it off the same body style truck years ago and saved it because I kind of like these hitches. They're kind of neat. Uh, I'll admit the damn thing is ugly and it hangs down low, but this ain't going to be a wheeling rig anyway. Uh, yeah, all I had to do is go buy some bolts to put it on there. And you know, the truck's already ugly as it is. What difference does the bumper make? Um, if I find that I like this truck and start driving it more and want to make this look better, I might raise it up, yeah, cut the mounts off there, redrill them, raise the whole thing up, and then instead of just using the ball bolted to that, I will weld a piece of receiver tubing onto the bottom of this. Now, to those of you that are not familiar with these hitches, what makes them neat is you don't have to get uh, perfectly aligned with your trailer. You can get just within a couple of inches of it. How this works... I don't have enough hands here, folks. So you can see... And these will pull up too, but they're a little stiff. Uh, there's some springs in them. They're rusty from sitting around. I might try to get them freed up one of these. But basically, these will pull up and there's like a uh, a block here that falls into place that keeps this from side to side. So yeah, if your trailer hitch is off to here, you would pick that up, push this over to the side, drop your trailer on it. Basically, all you got to do is drive and it will pull itself back into place. And in order to get it to slide in this way, all you got to do is start driving and hit your brakes or when you first go to uh, start moving, just back it up and it'll slide this into place like so. Another good thing about this bumper and hitch setup was it was already set up at the perfect height for the trailer for this truck. Now, tomorrow I'm putting this truck to the test. As you may recall, way, way, way back at the beginning of this video, I was going to use this for towing. And I still wanted to end this video with, you know, a towing test. I've got a truck i got to go pick up in the next town over and I won't even have to get out on the highway. I can just take gravel roads. So whatever that clattering noise is, be it the uh, flex plate or the engine or the transmission or whatever, clattering noise be damned. This thing is getting put to the test tomorrow. Well, today's the big day, putting her to the test. Got all my tie down stuff. Got some uh, transmission fluid here because the transmission still leaks. It kind of comes and goes as it pleases. Uh, about the only trend I've noticed is it kind of goes away when it warms up. But yeah, I wouldn't count on that. It's kind of a limited exposure with this thing so far. I have seen it actually started up cold and it's it's damn near a stream coming out of there. So a couple gallons of that. Got uh, six gallons of gas here because the fuel gauge doesn't work. Should be enough gas in the truck, but what the hell, there's plenty of room here to take it along. And I've also got a fire extinguisher because also with that transmission leak, it leaks right onto the hot exhaust. Let's take a look, see what it's doing today. Doesn't seem to be doing anything at the moment that I can tell. 
All right, let's head out. see it's loaded up uh, it started raining and I have no wipers uh, and also coming down his driveway I'm not sure which but some of my wheels were uh, locking up so I don't think all four of my brakes are working equally well, at least the weight on the trailer is not nearly as noisy a pretty good hill here I guess the nice thing about testing it on gravel, you don't have the momentum build up that you do on a paved road. Or I don't with this anyway, especially not being able to hardly see with no wipers. It's actually doing pretty respectful driving its way up this hill. I don't know what gear I'm in. Yes, yeah, driving its way up this hill in third gear, not too shabby. It's actually not so bad. It's washed the dust off my wheel. 
Well, folks, I think it's time to wrap up this shit show. When I got home with this thing, it rained all afternoon. I got out here in the rain, and if you remember, I the distributor had the, the double-sided armature, and I had the other side modified for 26 degrees of advance. I took the distributor out, flipped the armature around, and added the extra six more degrees of advance. And I also put in the other light spring from the kit so the advance would come in quicker. I got it all mapped out before and after, but you know, you get the idea. I added more advance, bottom line. Took it out for another drive. In the rain again. There might have been a little bit of difference, not a lot. And I noticed when I would have it in third gear and put my foot in it going up a hill, I would get a little bit of rattling, pinging noise. So I figure I've, I've reached the limits of what advance I can get out of this thing. Yeah, the rattling coming from the bell housing, it never failed, whatever it was. Didn't get any worse either. Um, I feel with a manual transmission, either a 4-speed or a ZF 5-speed, and an alignment to where it wasn't so squirrely and you could actually get a run at hills at highway speed, this might make an adequate tow rig. Great, no, but adequate, sure. Uh, a really good use for this would be if somebody just needed like a, uh, a farm chore truck. You know, it's going to spend all its time in 4 low with a bale stabber in the back, moving bales, plowing snow. Staying on the property in four low. That, that'd be a great use for this truck. Um, my ultimate goal with this, I was hoping that it would be good enough to use my gooseneck trailer to pull two vehicles with. It, there's no way. This thing would not be up to that. So in order to make it up to that, I'd probably have to swap gears and do a bunch of other stuff. And I've just kind of decided I'm just not that excited about putting that much work into this truck. I have a crew cab dually truck and a 5.9 Cummins and a 6-speed ZF, I need to put all that together. My time would be much better spent putting into that rig in order to pull my gooseneck with two vehicles on it. So I'm just put, gonna put a fork in this one. Uh, anybody interested in buying it, I'd sure sell it. Otherwise, it's just gonna sit around here in limbo and I do have a couple other ideas for it in the future. Uh, one, it could be a beater wheeler. And number two would be to mount a contraption that I wanna build on the back. Basically, this would just be a uh, a mobile base for the contraption I'd like to build. I'm not going to go into what it is. It'll probably never happen, but if it does, it'll be awesome. Uh, my apologies for this video being so long. I tried to edit it the best I could and still tell the tale appropriately. And yeah, just think of it from my point of view. I spent the last, what, six months working on this only to come up, you know, kind of disappointed. But uh, anyway, thanks for watching, and until next time. Watch out for your cornhole, bud.